Okay, hello everybody. So I'm going to do a React video for the first time. Obviously, this isn't exactly a React video in the sense that I can just always edit it out. Um, I could not use it if it's just really rubbish and I can cut it down. Well, I will have to cut it down because it's going to be long, obviously. It's going to be like twice as long as this 16-minute video. But uh, anyway, I thought it'd be a good idea just to give my live reaction to this EE video, which I haven't watched, about Universal Basic Income. And, you know, I've done some reading around universal basic income. I know a little bit about um, its effects on things like labor supply. I know a little bit about its effects on, you know, other uh, positive outcomes like health and uh, earnings later in life and entrepreneurship and things like that. So we'll see if that features in this EE video. My bet is going to be that they're not going to use very much evidence. Let's go. In the past three years, the US government has spent over $5 trillion on COVID relief stimulus on top of regular budgetary spending. In hindsight, most economists acknowledge that this was excessive and probably not implemented in the best possible way. Okay, so right off the bat, that seems completely wrong. I know lots of economists who don't think that it was excessive. Uh, Dean Baker springs to mind. Robert Reich, uh, I don't think Paul Krugman, for example, thinks it was excessive. Uh, Claudia Sam, uh, she's been a pretty outspoken supporter of the stimulus. Now, of course, you're, you're not going to find any economist or any person who supports absolutely everything put into it. So, of course, it could have been done better. I think policies you know, can always be improved. And uh, I mean, Frances Coppola, for example, has said that she thinks the stimulus that was after the main lockdown had been lifted, that was maybe excessive and maybe did contribute to inflation. Uh, but that specific component of it, I don't think amounts to her saying the whole thing was excessive. And I don't think any of those other economists have said that it was excessive as a whole. Uh, so yeah, most economists, I don't know where he's getting this from. Uh, in fact, God, already, okay, we're only bloody 15 seconds in. You can look at the IGM poll economists uh pandemic lockdown stimulus whoops well it's not stimulus um we'll call it stimulus because it, it gets called stimulus policy for the covid19 crisis um this is about lockdown Um, that's actually, none of that's actually about the, uh, about, that was, that wasn't about the, um, stimulus options specifically, abandoning lockdowns, COVID, uh, support. Uh, let's search within the IGM forum. Um, COVID st stimulus support. Ah, uh, okay. There's not. There's nothing. Okay, right. So, well, forget that. But you know, anyway, I I don't see why there's basis for that. And I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong there. The world doesn't need another opinion on government spending. But what this did do, if not... Wait, isn't this, this, this video is about universal basic income? That's government spending. Okay, let me just... Nothing just else is to spell the argument that the government doesn't have enough money to fund a universal basic income. That $5 trillion was enough to give every working age American $1,000 a month for the two years that COVID was seriously impacting business, which is naturally raising questions about if this would have been a better way to spend it. Indiscriminately giving money to everyone is not as crazy an idea as you might think, and arguments for a universal basic income are once again making their way into the mainstream. These proposals offer a lot of apparent advantages, which extend beyond just, it's nice to get free money. Some advocates for a UBI argue that it will do everything from actually cutting down on government expenditure to revolutionising the way that we operate our modern economies. 
We will get to all of that in this video, and we will also look at a lot of the problems with such a scheme. Problems that extend beyond just the obvious issue of who is going to pay for all of this free money. So to have an honest discussion about the viability of a universal basic income, we need to as always answer a few questions. How do advocates of this system propose that countries will pay to give money to all of their citizens? What advantage does a universal basic income have over traditional welfare systems? And of course, before you start collecting your free checks, what are the problems that we should consider before these systems are rolled out into our own economies? Okay, so those are three reasonable questions, to be fair. Like, it's, not, it's just not been, so, not been bad so far. I'm just going to speed it up. Um... This episode of Economics Explained was made possible by Public.com. If you are still using an old school stockbroker with high fees or a great current contribution up to 10,000, a universal basic income is a financial support system that gives money to everybody in an economy with very few exceptions. Normally UBI proposals don't include payments for people under the age of 18 or people who are not citizens of the country making the payment. Outside of that, everybody gets it. And everybody gets the same amount. It's universal. If you are a student studying full time, you get the UBI. If you're a working professional, you get the UBI. If you're a multi-millionaire, you get the UBI. Now, as for how much this universal payment is, that varies. Different proposals in different countries at different times have called for different amounts of money. But if you look into this topic, you'll probably find the best known proposal was Andrew Yang's $1,000 per month payment, which was the foundation of his unsuccessful 2020 presidential election bid. So let's use that as a working example. But keep in mind that some policymakers have called for more or less generous versions of this scheme. Of course, this $1,000 a month payment will mean different amounts to different people. The millionaire probably won't even notice the payment. The working professional will use this to subsidize their existing income. And to the student, it might make the difference between being able to study full-time with a part-time job versus studying part-time with a full-time job. This natural marginal utility is part of the charm of the UBI model, and it's also part of the way that it justifies its significant costs. In total, the US normally spends about half a trillion dollars a year on what you would typically think of as welfare between the federal and state governments. I'm using pre-2020 figures here because obviously with COVID relief stimulus, these numbers got a bit wacky. This also excludes Medicare and Medicaid because none of the major supporters of a UBI are suggesting that it replaces either of those programs. Now, of that half a trillion dollars, a not insignificant portion went to the administration of these social services. Things like caseworkers, auditors, contact staff, their managers, and all the other general expenses that go into running an operation as big as social security. If this was all replaced with a simple automatic transfer to everybody, most of this overhead could be made redundant, significantly cutting down on the expenses. Now, there are three major problems with this argument. The first is that of simple arithmetic. Yes, the American government currently spends about half a trillion dollars a year on social security, and if instead it introduced a universal basic income, it could choose to do away with all of these programs. But giving $1,000 a month to all eligible Americans would cost at least two and a half trillion dollars. This also makes the argument of cutting down on administrative costs a little bit hollow. Even if administrative costs were really at the extreme high end of some estimates and they could be eliminated entirely, you're cutting out $100 billion only to turn around and spend an extra $2 trillion by adopting a UBI. The third problem is with the universal... Wait, well, okay, so uh, it seems to me that the argument that UBI is more efficient to administer is not the same as the argument that, um, that it would cost less right so if you're talking about you know everyone hates bureaucrats uh sometimes fairly sometimes unfairly but if you're talking about the number of bureaucrats employed by the government and you know that whether that's because they're in different uh programs which would be merged into one because of ubi or whether it's because they are um means testing and, and enacting all these different tests that mean that people don't get something or might not get it uh that would also be eliminated under UBI, uh, you know, whichever of those two it is, there would be fewer of those people. And so there's a notion that that kind of spending is more intrinsically wasteful, right? Because it's not, um, you know, it's not really producing anything tangible. It's not actually helping anyone in any kind of way. So that, you know, that's a different argument to saying, obviously UBI would cost more overall because we'd be giving people money who didn't receive money now. Um, I would do want to say something about the calculation of like, um, I forget how much it was, but um, it, the calculation that was like what 2.2 um, .2 trillion or something like that, uh, that that's kind of misleading um, because, you know, the net cost, if for low income people, right, um, the net cost uh, to them as taxpayers is actually going to be negative, right? Um, and then to somebody who earns, say, exactly twelve thousand dollars, the net cost would be would be zero. It's only going to cost people who are above um, twelve thousand dollars, 
right so th this is this is a pretty classic argument by the way it's been in, like it's been recognized by a lot of people so it's just a matter of accounting how you choose to to describe the cost if you called it a negative income tax which maybe we'll talk about in in this section of the video if you called it a negative income tax then the cost would seem to be a lot lower but functionally they're exactly the same right it's under a certain floor you're getting you know x amount of money a thousand dollars a month um and then above that you start to get taxed right that's functionally the same as a ubi how we consider the cost is just a matter of accounting and matt brunick has written in depth about this uh the sort of accounting fictions of how much a ubi is going to cost no doubt it would be mean an expansion of the welfare state but again you know it's just some of this stuff's a little bit misleading and i feel like with the administration versus the delivery he's confused two two arguments there of a universal basic income, and that is because $1,000 a month is already below the poverty line for a single person household with no additional income. If a recipient has a disability, dependent children, or simply lives in a higher cost of living area, this payment becomes extremely inadequate. There are certain problems with welfare systems in basically every country in the world that has them. Administrative costs just being the tip of the problematic iceberg, but there is a reason that countries spend so much on making sure recipients are getting the right amount of money, and that's to make sure recipients get the right amount of money. You don't want people on welfare starving, and you also certainly don't want people taking advantage of a system to get more money than they really need without contributing their fair share to an economy. But moral arguments aside, all this shows is that there really is no genuine plan for a universal basic income that doesn't involve raising more taxes. Most supporters of a UBI do acknowledge that- That is true, to be clear, and in the video I'm saying that. Uh, I say that and uh, I will make a, another video about it at some point, um, probably Patreon only, but you know, yeah, we do need to raise taxes. Um, I've, I've forgotten the other thing he said, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, he was talking about, okay, it's not necessarily enough. He's saying UBI isn't necessarily enough. I, that's another thing I agree with. Um, I wouldn't consider it an argument against UBI though. It's just that UBI might need to be supplemented with other types of benefits, probably in kind benefits, right? So you'd be talking about like uh, various areas of health um, of education, of housing. Uh, so there's this idea of universal basic services. I don't consider those two an either or option. So there's a slight false dichotomy, um, but I do agree on those two counts. That it will need to be paid for with high taxes across the board, particularly on higher income earners and businesses. Depending on progressive tax brackets, this is normally proposed in such a way that middle income households don't earn any more or any less than they would have without the UBI. They might get an extra $12,000 per year, but they will pay an extra $12,000 a year in taxes because of the required increase in income tax rates. Of course, for low income households, like those that may have been subsidised with traditional welfare systems, very little of the additional $12,000 in income will be taxed, meaning it does effectively subsidise their household budget. So just to underscore the point I made earlier, he's saying this here, but he didn't incorporate it into his um, estimate of the cost of UBI. So absolutely correct, but then the cost of the UBI is actually smaller than There is certainly than nuance out. to the discussion that needs to be had around taxation to fund a UBI. Some advocates simply say that it should be funded with taxes levied exclusively on the extremely wealthy. The most noteworthy proposals include things like a top marginal tax rate of 70% for people earning over $10 million a year, or of course a wealth tax that takes a portion of someone's net worth over a certain figure, normally in the tens of millions. The other, probably more reasonable proposal is to remove long-term capital gains incentives and tax those earnings the same way that any other income would be taxed. Most of the time you hear about a billionaire selling their company for some crazy amount of money, they will be paying 15% on that income. If these tax rules were changed, they would be paying 37% on the majority of those gains. Or, you know, if a 70% tax rate for income over $10 million a year gets passed, they would pay that. Now, the classic counter-argument to this is that oppressive taxation will stifle the entrepreneurial spirit and disincentivize investments. Why would anybody risk starting their own company or making a risky investment if even the best-case scenario is them giving the majority of their income to the government, or having their investment gains slowly taxed away through a wealth tax? On the surface, this sounds reasonable enough, but really this argument is about as hollow as the one claiming that a UBI will justify itself by doing away with expensive welfare administration. People are going to risk starting their own companies and making risky investments because the potential returns are still there no matter how it's taxed. Nobody is going to pass up starting a $100 million company because they have to pay $37 or even $70 million in tax instead of $15 million. In any scenario, they are set for life. The only way to totally disincentivize the profit motive is to have a tax rate of over 100%, which obviously nobody is seriously proposing. An argument that might be a little bit more fair though is that if taxes are increased enough, wealthy people with the means to leave the country could just choose to leave the country. Now this is more difficult for American citizens because their taxes follow them everywhere unless they renounce their citizenship, but for every other country it's something that should genuinely be considered. I will give a totally anecdotal example. I am personally making nowhere near $10 million per year, but you know, I have a pretty successful YouTube channel that is making good money. This means I pay about 45% tax on my income here in Australia, which kind of hurts, especially when I know I could be doing the work that I do anywhere in the world with internet and electricity, and most of those places are going to have much lower taxes and much lower costs of living. But for now, you know, I kind of just deal with it. 
But if I was looking down the barrel of 70% income taxes, I'll be 100% honest with you guys. I would be one of those scumbags shopping around for a cheaper country to live in, especially since I could still remain an Australian citizen. That means Australia would lose my tax revenue entirely, and on this individual scale, they would actually be further behind on funding their new expensive UBI. Now, I'm sure the Australian government doesn't really care about me as an individual, but if enough people do this, and a lot of people already are, it could result in lower net tax revenues despite the high rate. Capital flight, as this is known, is normally an overblown issue, but remote working has kind of become a big thing in the past three years. Now lots of people don't have anything in particular holding them down to a certain location. Could governments around the world be doing a better job of effectively taxing extremely wealthy people? Absolutely. At the very least, they should be paying the same rate of tax as working class individuals. But governments also have to realise that people with lots of money have lots of options, and trying to get too much out of them can backfire. Unfortunately, a UBI would represent such a significant expenditure that the only way to sustainably fund it would be through tax increases in one form or another that would probably fall into the too much category for a lot of very wealthy people who are... Whoa, 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 okay. So, uh, maybe I'll just upload this full React video uh, to Unlearning Economics Live if people are interested in it. But, so the first thing is, you know, remote working and tax flight, you know, I, I mean, I don't know, we can all tell anecdotes, right? I have a friend who thought that he'd be able to remote uh, work work remotely in France uh, because we're out of the EU he's realized that he's actually not allowed to certainly not for any length of time uh, but the EU is the exception here right it's a free movement free trade area where you can go anywhere you want the most of the world is not like that so the amount of companies that will tolerate uh, remote working is is actually not necessarily that high um, you're usually tethered to to uh, a company and you're usually tethered to the country that that company is operating in uh or you know the the branch of that company that is operating in that country so that's a little bit of a myth certainly there can be flight i mean there's there's you know there's no estimates of how bad this is i know that the 70 percent tax rate you know was calculated based on these types of responses um, these types of elasticities, right? When you raise taxes, how much do you reduce revenues, right? The so-called Laffer curve effects. Uh, that work done by people like uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, Emmanuel Sayers, Gabriel Zuckman, for example, has looked at this, the actual evidence behind it, and it's it's settled on the 70% tax rate. So for him to then come around, turn around and say, oh, well, that's going to be too much, seems a little bit disingenuous. Like, I'd like to see some evidence here. There isn't any. Um, Certainly, I do agree that taxes should be increased, but like, um, yeah, that, that, that strikes me as disingenuous. Um, and, you know, whether it would get into the too much, even taking the 70% figure as, as too much, let's just agree with him that 70% is too much. Even taking that, is it the case that... Um, sorry, let me rephrase. Yeah, sorry, is it the case? Yeah, is it the case that seven, that the amount needed to raise money for a universal basic income will reach that 70% income tax rate, even if we think that's too much? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, that he doesn't explain why it would be. There's no calculations here, right? Um, so certainly, one thing I will say is that, that I often say, um, and is that, is that, you know, just thinking we can tax the rich to get uh, to where we need to be in terms of like social spending is incorrect right we do need broad based tax measures tax increases on like middle class people people like me who are earning i don't know uh in the top um hot certainly top half of the income distribution maybe the top quarter uh i don't know the last time i, will, I can't remember the last time i checked but you know we need these broad based tax increases for sure that's what the so social democrat countries have that's what the scandinavian countries have you can't just soak the rich you might want to anyway but even taxing you know rich people at a very high rate isn't actually going to raise that much revenue uh but th that would have been a better point for him to make i just don't see anything about the potential revenues for this needed needed for universal basic income here i don't know well already paying a lot of tax raising enough money to sustainably fund this program would be difficult to say the least and for the short term it would most likely involve governments taking on more debt to bridge the funding gap that's not necessarily a problem in and of itself especially not for the us because it uses the world's reserve currency but would it be worth it what would a ubi do for the economy it would certainly increase consumer demand. If everyone had an extra $1,000 in their pocket every month, that's an extra $1,000 that they could spend at businesses who could pass that $1,000 onto their suppliers, investors, or employees. This is the basic idea of all economic stimulus. More money in the economy means more consumption, more investment, and more employment. All other things being equal. 
but it also means more inflation, which I'm sure a lot of you have been thinking the entire time you've been watching this video. Inflation is honestly the biggest problem with the UBI, bigger even than the problem of how to fund the damn thing. Injecting that much money into the economy outside of a major economic downturn is simply going to cause demand pull inflation. I made a video on my second channel explaining everything that you need to know about inflation, so if you're unsure, feel free to pause this video and go and check that one out. Now a counter argument to this inflation problem is that if tax increases fully offset UBI expenditures, then the government won't actually be conducting expansionary fiscal policy, they will just have more money coming in and more money going out. Now if this argument was true, it would also mean that the stimulus benefits we explored earlier would be undone because on average everybody wouldn't have an extra thousand dollars in their pocket every month, they would have nothing extra. The thing is though, this argument isn't true. A UBI would have a stimulating effect on the economy because while on average the government may not be giving out more money, it is giving more to lower income households while taking tax money from wealthier households. If someone making five million dollars a year pays an extra million dollars in tax, their lifestyle probably wouldn't change radically. Chances are they would still live in a beautiful home, drive whatever car they wanted, travel whenever they had time, and eat out without thinking twice about it. Likewise, if that same person got an extra $12,000 a year, it's very unlikely that their spending decisions would change at all. But for people earning a low salary, these adjustments would make a big difference. Most people on even good incomes basically save nothing, which means everything they earn is going to taxes or expenditure, and this is especially true for people on low incomes. Now since a UBI would be structured in such a way as to increase the net income of people on lower incomes, that would mean that spending would increase for these households, probably by an amount close to $12,000. So, the net aggregate result would be minimal reductions in spending from high income households, accompanied by massive increases in spending from lower income households, which would put strong upwards pressure on consumer prices. I know a UBI sounds like one of those ideas that's so crazy it just might work, but it's probably not. A UBI is often proposed as a solution to the problems of automation. What are we going to do in a future where machines do the jobs of people better than people can? Okay, so it seems like he's talking about automation now, so um, I'm, I reckon I'm probably going to agree with him on this. Uh, a UBI will cause inflation. Okay, this is this is the kind of the bit of the video I was waiting for, because before it was all about like the basics and taxes and stuff, which isn't necessarily what my video is about. Uh, a UBI will cause inflation. Where, where's the evidence for that? He literally hasn't presented any evidence whatsoever. This, you know, there's loads of UBI experiments. Where's the evidence that it affected inflation? And he's he's used the inflation in the USA today as evidence that UBI will cause will cause inflation. And it's like, well, okay, do you think there's maybe some other stuff going on right now? Do you remember like the global pandemic? The massive lockdown that we had? Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the resultant soaring energy prices, the ongoing problems with our supply chains? I, I don't understand why none of that features in, you know, this is a very simple argument, right? He's just done a, a really simple sort of what's called a post hoc ergo propter hoc. It's like this happened, then this happened, therefore this caused this. Well, no, because um, just because there was stimulus uh, or support or relief or whatever you want to call the whole COVID package for people and businesses, just because those happened, then inflation happened, you know, a bit after and has got worse, especially since since the Russian invasion, noticeably worse, you know, doubling, in fact, from like about 5% to about 10% in lots of countries. You know, just because, just because, uh, yeah, so, so, so just because you had that sequence of events, why would you attribute it to the stimulus measures? I really, really don't understand. So, yeah, um, that just, the takeaway there is there's absolutely no evidence. And I don't know about the positive effects of UBI. Like, he hasn't spoken about, like, the positive effects it might have on, like, nutrition. The positive effects it might have on, like, child rearing. Um, the positive effects it might have on people getting education. Uh, the positive effects that it might have on entrepreneurship. All of these things are observed in the studies that we're going to talk about. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, so so why hasn't he discussed them? Because they're they're counterinflationary. They're like supply side, right? So they increase the supply side. If you think of inflation very simplistically perhaps as just too much money chasing too few goods, which is I think the framework this guy's going from, then you know, if you can increase the goods and services, right, the supply side, the capacity of the economy through these things education, entrepreneurship, um, nutrition and, and productivity, child rearing and things like that, then you might counteract any demand side inflationary effects. So there might be some slight ones at certain times, right? But you know, the, 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 what's the relative magnitude? Um, nothing, nothing from this video to make up our minds on that question.
I think what a UBI does do really well is act as a thought experiment or a case study to address a lot of the big issues that we face in modern advanced economies. Wealth inequality, welfare systems, global capital mobility, and what we're going to do when robots take all of our jobs. We are going to need answers to these questions. On one extreme you have the laissez-faire, let them all starve approach, and on the other hand you have the what if we gave everyone free money approach. Obviously, the real solution to these issues lies somewhere in between these two extremes. But that doesn't mean that there isn't value in thinking about how something like this could play out. I'm not even going to say anything. I don't think people like Andrew Yang genuinely believe that the US would ever adopt his proposed UBI system. But just the fact that he raised the idea in a setting as serious as a presidential campaign means that a lot of people have learned about it, and a lot of people might be thinking of toned down alternatives. Maybe the real universal basic income was the friends we made along the way. Um, let me just say, actually, I said I wasn't going to say anything, but clearly that's impossible. A UBI is a compromise, right? It's actually, you know, a UBI, perhaps funded by, you know, progressive taxation, generally higher taxation, a land value tax is one big way that Georgists kind of like to say, you know, here's our perfect tax and here's our perfect welfare. And, you know, they go, they go together. You know, uh, that is a compromise, right? It really is a compromise. Lots of leftists, and there's, there's a book um, called, uh, oh God, um, let me just, let me just like edit that over now. Uh, welfare beyond markets or something along those lines uh, which, which really has a go at things like UBI as basically not really um, interrogating or, or shifting uh, the main dynamics of capitalism and markets right because it's just they think of it as just like a plaster and they think of it as very consumer centric just give people money and you know they can spend it on what they want whereas they would say maybe benefits should be delivered in kind what we were talking about earlier right housing and, and services and stuff um and it, it's it's kind of indiv individualistic a universal basic income so i'm not i'm i'm a backer of a universal basic income but i want to say it is the compromise Right, it's the compromise that that sort of smooths out some of the rough edges of capitalism, prevents the worst of poverty in a fairly streamlined and efficient way, um, without the need for actually a massive government bureaucracy. It's just a transfer, right? Uh, so, and and like as as he said, a lot of these proposals, twelve thousand dollars a year, you know, that's not very much. You you might just about be able to live on that if you live, you know, in the middle of nowhere. But it's not it's not loads, right? So really, really, UBI is the compromise. Nobody can predict the future, least of all economists. But it's important that we are always stress testing new ways to make the lives of economic participants more comfortable, whichever way the world does go. Now, the best way to make sure that you are as comfortable as possible is by investing for the long term, which is made a lot easier with today's sponsor, public.com. If you already use a brokerage, let Uh, okay. Wasn't there already an advert? Okay, it's fine. Um, so... Yeah, uh, I think just the complete absence of evidence on the positive effects of UBI is really striking to me. The complete absence of evidence full stop was very striking in this video. Uh, I, I don't think there's evidence for the contention that UBI will increase inflation. I don't think there's evidence for the contention that a 70% tax rate on the rich or higher is going to cause any type of um, capital flight and it is quite disappointing i will say that I, it's not as bad as i worried it would be I, I i worried it would it would say lots of things that were really really demonstrably wrong um but it, it's just like it's somewhat misleading and it's definitely missing uh, all of the experiments and studies that have been done on ubi so i mean i don't know what the commenters are saying should we should we look at the the comments I think the proposals for UBI are the middle ground in the what if automation thought experiment. Yeah. The middle ground between just letting extra people starve and completely socializing all the benefits of automation. That's true. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean... This guy's saying he doesn't think it's inflationary, but TLDR. I don't understand why there's no... Nobody's noticed uh, the complete la lack of... Uh, lack of evidence, but, you know, whatever. 
Okay, right. So I think uh, I hope you enjoyed my first ever React video and hopefully my last one. Uh, but I just thought it might be refreshing to do this because uh, I've never done it before. So, you know. See you soon.